What's up and welcome to the Level Health Podcast. We've got Erin O'Laughlin on the show today. Erin is a researcher, naturopath, personal trainer, and health coach with a PhD in physical activity motivation. Today, we're discussing body image in the fitness and nutrition space and about the research she has conducted and some interesting studies she has coming out soon. Big thanks to Erin for coming on our show. You can check out her Instagram at eko.coaching or her website. We'll have both of those linked in the description below. Thanks for listening, and we hope you enjoyed the episode. Erin, thank you for joining me today. Of course. Thank you for having me and inviting me on your show. Oh, of course. I think it's been kind of a long time coming because we've uh, come across each other's paths a lot on social media over the past couple of years. I mean, you're part of the comprehensive coaching community. I'm, assuming, that's, I'm sure that's where I ran into. Yeah. So, I, I mean, so. yeah. And so I, we kind of just keep running into each other. But um, I reached out to you because you uh, talk a bit about like body image and, and that, but really... Um, what kind of intrigued me even more is that you're working in a lab, you're working in and working with people, you're, you're learning and you're continuing to grow and it's clear in your content as well. Um, but before we get started, if you don't mind, can you just give us some background on who you are and why you do what you do? Yeah, sure. Um, so basically it's hard to always <laughs> to talk about yourself in a nutshell mm -hmm. without being too boring and rambling on, but, um, I, a while ago, I got extremely interested in why people, some people are more active than others, because I've always been very active, and I had friends who say, like, it just seems so easy for you, like, why, like, how can you just be so consistent, I'm like, I don't know, <laughs> and um, I spoke to my master's supervisor at the time, and I was like, maybe I should go into kinesiology, and, and you know, really double down on the physiology of the body, because I'm interested in helping people, be more active. And she's like, no, no, you need to go into behavior science. You need to uh, learn of all these theories of motivation and so on and so forth. So that's why I decided to dedicate kind of my academic career in to a certain sense of human behavior and behavior science and specifically physical activity and motivation. So um, I got during my master's, I worked on a project where we were evaluating an intervention for breast cancer survivors and looking to see if um, curves, which is a gym where you do a circuit, mm -hmm. I don't believe it exists anymore, um, helped uh, women improve their um, physical activity levels, of course, but I was also looking at it in terms of psychological variables like uh, anxiety, depression, and self-esteem, for example. And then for my PhD, I started getting interested in active video games. So I'm not sure if you knew that about me, but uh, I started looking into how um, we can help the population or a certain subset of the population get more active by using, you know, screens. So that yeah. was just for my PhD. Yeah, I think anybody that's done a, a VR game can realize how, how uh, difficult they can be. And that's interesting because I, I did it start with like the Wii, you know, we had the Wii, the Nintendo Wii, and everybody was like, oh, this is going to get people to exercise. What is your, what was your experience with that? Was it successful? So the, the, what I do is a little bit different. So the, in the active video game, I'm going to call it extra gaming world is that there's lots of clinical trials. Like if we give kids this game, does it increase their physical activity? Or if we give adults this game, does it help them uh, with their rehab? The way I look at, at it is more of like a population based um, way is like what's happening in general without yeah. interventions, are people extra gaming and is it helping them increase their physical activity levels? And so far, we haven't found that it contributes significantly to overall physical activity levels. It seems to be this behavior that people kind of transition into when there's like a new game or something that gets released. They're mm. active for like Pokemon, for example, and then it kind of dwindles and then it comes back and it kind of dwindles. And I'll get the uh, criticism like, well, then what's the point? And I'm like, well, if you look at a soccer season, you're, you know, you're very active throughout the season. And then maybe you might switch to something else during another season. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that people transition in and out of it. But is it the answer to, you know, our global problem of physical act inactivity, perhaps for a subsample of people, but not for everyone? Oh, yeah, that, make, that makes, I mean, how many people can't, wouldn't even be able to figure out how to, how to operate one of those, those consoles. You mentioned curves, and um, my experience with that is um, my mother went to it for a period of time when I was younger, but I'm wondering, um, and this is kind of, kind of a little bit more of a meta question, but I was wondering, you obviously have a, a good perspective on this. What is the effect, um, you mentioned the psychological outcomes is what you're monitoring, of the, the female only, the female focused um, gym or training facility, because there's, there's quite a few of them in the area. 
And I, I've always wanted to know, including like gold, we'll have the, you know, the, the room to the side. Um, yeah. Is it actually beneficial for people? Are there clear benefits um, or is it just, um, just another option? That's a, that's a really good question. It wasn't necessarily part of my research question, but I think in terms of, I can only speak to like the breast cancer survivor population mm -hmm. in that way. And because they had had treatment, um, surgeries, and, and various, um, you know, things happen to them before, during, and after treatment, uh, the women only aspect was very appealing because there was other women like them going mm. through the circuit. So it wasn't necessarily just women. It was women who also were diagnosed and treated with cancer going mm. to the circuit. So having someone understand the same experience as they did was really beneficial. And then I think, um, to answer your question more broadly, is that having like these women only spaces sometimes can um, diminish some barriers perceived or not from some women to actually enter a space of yeah. weight training. Um, and perhaps they like it and they stay, or perhaps, you know, it, it removed that barrier. They're like, this isn't so bad. Maybe I can go to a gym with Gen Pop, for example. Mm -hmm. um, did I answer your question? No, okay. yeah, of course. <laughs> that, that, that makes complete sense because um, the question, I guess the thing that bothers me the most is when gyms or even just the fitness industry as a whole is very exclusionary. It, it's not welcoming to people. And we see that around New Year's when everybody's like, you know, don't mean, don't be mean to the newbies and stuff like that. But I always feel that's a little half-hearted because the underlying culture certainly is not one that welcomes people in. So I've always, I've been curious. I mean, I've spoke with um, actually just leading up to this podcast, a few breast cancer su survivors. And um, one of them said uh, that the most of the to say negative comments, but uh, less than thoughtful comments have come from women, um, you know, and perhaps it wasn't meant to be um, malicious or anything, but it, it just was. And so that's why I was kind of wondering, I've always been curious, like, is it actually a safer space or is it just perceived as one? Um, but I guess it doesn't, you know, as long as people get in the door and they're comfortable, I think that's what's most important. Exactly. So perhaps if you're a woman and you're, and you already feel comfortable going into a space of, you know, we're a gen pop and it wouldn't be a barrier, but perhaps if you already perceive this as a barrier, it could be just, you know, removing that barrier can help initiate your journey into the weight room. And I, I I'd like to talk more uh, potentially on what the um, downstream effects of just getting in a good, you know, weightlifting routine and everything like that. But um, before we move on from kind of talking about your PhD and everything, um, is this kind of a shift um, that's happening at a larger scale? So you mentioned, you know, kinesiology and physiology. That's kind of the default, I think, for fitness and health-minded people in this sphere. But it seems like behavior change and the psychological component is the kind of the new frontier for this. So is, is that kind of a, a good uh, kind of way to paint it? Um, yeah, I think, you know, more and more um, programs in kinesiology are requiring more behavioral science classes be included as part of their degree. So physical activity, motivation, sports, psychology, exercise, psych, um, body image classes are all now kind of trickling into that type of education. And I think it's just gonna make for a more well-rounded oh. theologist to, to, be, uh, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> no, I would completely agree. It's certainly one of the, the, the aspects well, we didn't really know that we were missing it, right? We didn't even really sure. know that it was a piece that we needed to be sure. a, not even an expert in, but just even not, not even to say pro necessarily proficient in, just aware of and how your 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 words and your actions and and your um, your social media especially can kind of be damaging to people without really even uh, being aware of that fact. Well, of course, and you know, in the last few years we've kind of veered away from this like weight centric approach to health mm. to kind of a more health oriented approach to health or a weight neutral approach to health and if, uh, as research continues and things move forward you know in five years we might say well we've learned a little bit more from now and things will continue to change I think that's just a good thing building upon previous research it, it, like I heard a stat and uh, I'll probably say this wrong but Depending on the field, we can be 20 years outside of the research when practice starts to finally start changing. So mm -hmm. we're in a weird space, though, too, because we can do so much self-experimentation 
um, in our field. And we saw that kind of reflected in how bodybuilders were kind of at the forefront of everything for a very long time. And, you know, the highest level elite athletes are, are as well. And then it comes 10, 20 years later, everybody's like, oh, low carbs is the, the next thing. But it's like bodybuilders were doing carb cycling back in the early 2000s and, and earlier. Right. So it's one of those things I think it, uh, we're able to put into practical application things that aren't necessarily borne out in the research yet. And I think that's where talking with people like yourself and, and others is so important because getting uh, a framework. I mean, I talked to um, uh, Dr. Fundero and Shannon creating the comprehensive coaching framework and, and, and really being able to see that there are so many tools out there and, and, and processes that you can put into place to, to enact these things that are really kind of on, not on the fringe, but they're at the forefront of where our field is. Yeah, I love that. And thank you for kind of clumping me with those two, because <laughs> those are uh, women that I admire. And Shannon really opened the door for me um, in terms of learning about body image and how to incorporate that into my own coaching. Because much like her, I, through my coaching, you know, I, I always felt like this has to be, there has to be something beyond macros. There has to be something beyond you know, the reps and the sets, because it's just not working for everybody. If anything, it was working for a very small minority mm. of my clients. And then when I started like learning about relationship with food and body image and how to incorporate that in my coaching for any clients who are open to learning about it, um, has changed things for me and for my clients. And I just feel so much more secure in my coaching now to be honest. Oh, I would completely agree. I mean, I look back to, uh, as a fledgling personal trainer and I don't even think that we're, we were primed to even recognize the people we were leaving behind. We kind of just, uh, you know, categorized it as they didn't want it bad enough. I don't think I was ever that bad, but it's the, you know, you know, the thought process, uh, you know, they just weren't prioritizing it or anything like that. And that's not to say that every single person that you work with, you're going to be able to make and, and create lasting changes. But certainly, you like you said, it has to go just a couple steps further than than the macros or you know the sets, reps, and everything like that. And so I know that you mentioned that you're not an expert in body image, and I and I always like I was actually telling my clients earlier today um, that I've realized that the people um, whose opinions are worth hearing are very vocal about their their limitations. So even on, on the front, you know, just as an, as your opinion of any, if you'd like to point out whenever you're kind of conjecturing, but um, what are some common misconceptions about body image and, and where, what is, how does that play out in just the general population? Yeah. Um, and thank you for saying that. I just felt uncomfortable calling myself a body image expert because mm -hmm. I didn't do my PhD in body image. And I know I could say something that someone who is more versed in the literature would be like, that's ludicrous. Didn't you read at all 2021? I'm like, no, I didn't read it. So, um, okay. So to answer your question, um, I'll, I'll, I'll take the lens of, of, of a coach, right? So you, one of the biggest misconceptions I think, and, and this Shannon often says this, Shannon Beer, is that you think that working on your, your body image, um, AKA reducing negative body image, increasing positive body image means giving up on yourself. It means that you're going to let yourself go, which is definitely not the case at all. So research, you know, strongly supports that those who quote unquote like themselves, and it doesn't have to be this body positivity movement. It's just more that you work on body functionality, appreciation, um, you know, acceptance and, and those type of areas you actually tend to treat yourself better. Therefore, your health habits kind of come more in check rather than using the guilt and shame spiral mm. to fuel your habit change. So that is one thing that I do work on with my clients, especially when they're supremely hard on themselves and they talk negatively about their body. I try to bring that into the conversation as much as possible. So that is, I think, one of the biggest misconceptions. Uh, the second biggest misconception in my, um, in my opinion is that there's this belief that being in a smaller body, losing weight, losing fat, uh, getting, you know, changing your leanness or your body composition will lead to this inherent happiness and this inherent satisfaction in your life and this inherent uh, energy levels and feeling better and everything. And um, it could be true. This is not like, I'm not saying that it's, it's completely false, but there's no guarantee. And I think mm. that there's this conception that it's an absolute guarantee that if I lose weight, I will be happier. I will get that date. I will get that job. And I will just be this happy, shining person just when that weight is off. So I think those are the two biggest ones. 
Yeah, I wanted to talk about those a little bit. And I think it was great to hear kind of an operational definition of improving body image, reducing negative and increasing positive. Um, and I think we may come back to that at some point, but you mentioned your first one, let themselves go. I can tell you for a fact that I have, oh, I guess not a fact, it's anecdotal evidence, but um, I was entirely obsessed with everything, fitness, nutrition, everything. And my physique has backslid maybe a half a percent since I stopped obsessing over every single thing. I mean, actually, uh, thank goodness I came across uh, Dr. Fundero and Gabby and Shannon's work because th that I remember very clearly I did not want to have Halloween candy in the house. And then I started, uh, okay, I can have a piece of candy. It's not going to be the worst thing in the world. And I cannot track my, actually, I put my Fitbit back on a week ago for the first time in over a right. year. And uh, yeah, it's actually, I just did it because I was, I'm working more hours at the gym. I wanted to see how much I walk, but I'm not sitting here waiting until, you know, I, I got to get on the treadmill because I have 500 steps I need to get for today. So there's definitely a layer that you can peel back. Um, and then also the smaller, or even, I wouldn't even say smaller, bigger as well for men, typically it's, they want more muscle and they think, oh, the muscle is going to be what gives them um, the confidence and everything like that. But I can tell you some of the least confident and most unhappy people I've ever met have been getting ready to step on a physique stage or, you know, getting ready to go to, oh gosh, getting ready for whatever it is, the beach in the summer, whatever it is. And in fact, in the world we live in now with social media, it's constant. There's always something you always have to look good for pictures. You always have to have this. So yeah, it's, it's definitely not clear whatsoever that changing your uh, body composition is going to lead to anything that you think it's going to. I know. And it's for me when, so I should reiterate that I was working with Shannon on a personal level, not only through the, the comprehensive coaching, I decided if I was going to go the route of, um, doing the body image work with my own clients that I, I, I needed to do the work myself to go through that experience. And I was very resistant when Shannon was saying things to me, like, there's no guarantee Aaron, if you get leaner, that you will be happier. You could, but there's no guarantee. And then if your happiness is so tied to this particular leanness, your body will change again. And then when it's, when that fluctuation happens, how are you going to handle that? And it was such a hard pill to swallow. I kind of almost wanted to refuse to believe <laughs> that my, my body would change again. And that, um, I wouldn't, it ties so much to my leanness because for so long in the past I had but when I was able to swallow the pill sit back and be like this is so true like my world opened up it was very enlightening for me I was I'm so happy I went through that experience with Shannon what were some of the other things that kind of stand out um, from your working with her I mean one of the biggest things for me I think is body checking and like just walking yeah. by a mirror you have to flex you got to lift up your shirt see if you still yeah. have abs guess what they're still there um, but it's yeah. like, it's one of those things. What are some other uh, kind of indications? That was for me, definitely what I needed to work on. But what are some of those other uh, hurdles for you? Uh, for, for me, with, as coaching or personally? On or a both? personal level. Uh, so body checking was one of them. I, I wasn't even familiar with the term or familiar that I was really doing it. Um, but <laughs> <I just, laughs> It's subconscious entirely. Oh, yeah. It's so crazy. I did the morning app check all the time. And um, it came, I don't know how it came um, to be as part of the conversation with Shannon, but one of the first exercises she made me do was to track my body checking and how often I did it. And just that awareness, I, I started decreasing my body checking. And that's, and I can't say that I never body check because I probably mm -hmm. do. No, I for sure do, but it's been reduced. But one thing that being aware of my body checking uh, helped me with is just noticing my body less every day anyways just mm. being like you know the the term embodiment just being living like through my body rather than being like an object to be kind of observed observed um has been so freeing and I think like everyone in my life has even noticed a difference in how I'm just how it can just be more rather than like feeling like I'm under this lens that I was creating for myself <laughs> yeah it's always for yourself um <clears throat> I guess also, it, I think it's, is it important to think about what your internal thoughts are around that body checking? Because it can, I think it can be positive. I don't think it usually is, but can that sometimes be positive? And then kind of mentioning like the functionality of your body and appreciating other things than the aesthetic appeal. Is mm -hmm. there a way to do these things or just even to shift them slightly so they're more positive? Oh, sorry, my uh, thing's going off. 
Um, to shift, to make body, I think, yes, I think you're right where it's like, I just checking your body um, might not necessarily inherently be a bad thing, but it's your reaction or your thought process to that checking that can be the issue that spirals out of control. So you ab check and you don't see the abs. Therefore you say, I need to diet. I need to double down. I need to be stricter. I need to do more cardio. You know, it's kind of maladaptive. Uh, I'm, I'm, I can't think of an example where body checking would be adaptive, but I'm sure there are some. Do you have any? No, I'm just curious because I think it really would maybe come down to the internal dialogue around it at the very yeah. moment of, at the very moment of, and it certainly would be a slippery slope perhaps because my, like you very much said, like I'm pinching the love handles. I'm looking at like, oh, I've got, you know, a little fat hair that I've done before, whatever it is. I've, gosh, there's so many layers to that, but I think that um, just developing a little bit more of an appreciative approach to it. But I think that these are almost kind of an oxymoron, like that obsessive, not even obsessive compulsive, but just obsessed with the appearance and checking that I don't know. That's a, that's just like a little bit too much to juggle perhaps to, to make those thoughts positive and still be performing the behaviors that are often not. Yeah. I think a lot boils down to your intention to body checking, right? Is your intention to body check um, or just checking in the mirror to like, you know, straighten out this, make sure I don't have something in my teeth um, at the gym, making sure that I have great form. And if your internal dialogue isn't going to like okay, my form's good, but like, look, my role is showing like that sucks mm. and, and, and it trickles down. Or can you just literally look at yourself and body check for like an adaptive reason? Like, oh, I'm shrugging my shoulders during this press. Maybe I need to like retract and like brace my core yeah. a bit more. So maybe I can, I can be convinced that that could be a bit more adaptive yeah. um, <laughs> than, uh, than body checking. Um, I think sometimes you body check too, to be, to feel more secure. Like I do still have my abs. And then it trickles down into like, well, why do you need these abs to feel secure and valued? I think Shannon might, Shannon might ask that question. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd be like, Shannon, shut up. I just want to have a six pack. But at the <laughs> same time, I mean, yeah, I guess, yeah, it absolutely could be. But again, I think it comes to what comes next. What are you thinking along those lines? If you're like, oh man. And then also that is evidence potentially that could reinforce. And it's certainly evidence that reinforced my ability to step away from other components, like the obsessive tracking, the obsessive monitoring of steps, because I'm checking and then I'm realizing, oh, actually it's been two weeks. I'm not really counting every calorie. I'm, I'm, I'm gaining more freedom by the day and I'm not losing the aesthetic component. So I, I yeah, you know what? I think we just solved the problem. It could be positive, but it, I think it does come down to like, what are those initial thoughts right after? That's, that's a really, really great example. I I'm, I'm down for that example. And it's funny you, you, you're talking a lot about like tracking and, um, fitness tracking and, and my fitness pal tracking. It's something, so go, going back to extra gaming or active video games, one could be convinced that using these types of tools could be a form of extra gaming, right? Like if you look at gaming itself is you get points, you get rewards, you get feedback through a screen. Um, you know, it, that's debatable. But I am, I have, do have a slight interest in, in fitness tracking and I have published in that area and we have a publication coming out soon on the predictors. So it's longitudinal work, which we don't see a lot of predictors of food and activity tracking. So usually these studies tend to be more cross-sectional, so you can't like infer causation. And I'm not saying that the study that we created will definitely be causal, but it does look at predictors of food and activity tracking. And one of our main conclusions, just as a synapse is that like the intention behind the tracking is what matters the most, not the behavior itself. Did you want to elaborate on that anymore? I can't believe we went this far without you mentioning, um, not to mention there's longitudinal studies that are, seem to be kind of hard to come by in fitness in general. Um, yeah. But so you're looking at what are the predictors of like, uh, you know, bad outcomes or? So what, no, what the, unfortunately we didn't have the data vice versa. So I'm lucky enough. I have another position at the university of Montreal where I work on a longitudinal project called end it, which is nicotine dependence in teens, which interesting tidbit. It's my mother who is the principal investigator of that study. So she's an epidemiologist. So I didn't, Apple didn't fall far from the tree. Mm. I'm not an epidemiologist, but I'm in research. And uh, through that study, which started in 1999 and the uh, participants are now in their early thirties, um, I actually asked, can we put in these measures to see if they use MyFitnessPal or like Noom or I, I put Carbon Diet Coach and Macro Factor, you know, the big ones in there. And um, we were able to look at 
Um, behavioral predictors, so like um, kind of eating behaviors, whether you are high on compensatory behaviors or your fruits and vegetable consumption, for example, uh, socio-demographic, um, you know, um, uh, your education, your, uh, your language, because in, in Canada, language is important. Well, I know it is everywhere else, but we have this French English thing here. Um, and different socio-demographic characteristics, um, psychological, so depression, uh, diagnosed eating disorder, diagnosed, you know, diagnoses. Um, and also these kind of psychosocial variables like body shame and embarrassment, um, guilt and shame around the body, um, self-conscious emotions. We were able to look to see if, you know, all these different predictors predicted whether or not you food trapped. Um, and I think our time lag was four to five years. That's very interesting. So uh, again, if you could give me a little bit longer of a synopsis, uh, what, what were some of the, the general findings? Yeah, so it's not published yet. Okay, just whatever you get, whatever you get. Yeah, it's accepted. Uh, and we did a, a revision. So um, it basically we found that um, pressure to lose weight, um, uh, viewing someone, viewing yourself as being overweight, um, wanting to lose weight, um, having high body embarrassment. Um, scoring high on compensatory behaviors. So meaning if you feel like you've overeaten, you do all these compensatory behaviors, mm -hmm. you restrict you, you know, that kind of thing. Um, being diagnosed with an eating disorder, uh, they all predicted tracking. So it was mostly kind of a negative cluster mm -hmm. of predictors. Well, I, I'm, I'm labeling them negative. Um, maybe I shouldn't, but that predicted food tracking. Uh, which is which, which is very interesting. Yeah, of course. And I wonder what would it be some of the, you said not negative, but uh, some of the potentially positive indicators that would lead to that thing. And I think that to that same behavior, the food tracking, and I think kind of on the same thing as the body checking, I think that that list would be much smaller. I don't know that there are many positive behaviors, not to say that tracking can't be positive. Of course it can be um, for certain people, but it certainly yeah. seems like the positive uh, indicators would be a much smaller list. I, I, I'm kind of actually struggling to come up with what something that would be entirely positive would lead to obsessive tracking behaviors. Yeah, so we didn't, um, our outcome was just if they tracked, um, hmm. we didn't have enough data to actually really fine tune the variable, the outcome variable, meaning like the frequency, we didn't have, a, a, hmm. it was a large sample, our sample's about 700. Um, but not everyone tracked, of course. However, on the flip side, um, we did also do the same predictors, but our outcome was physical activity tracking, which meeting the physical activity guidelines actually predicted physical activity tracking. So whether it's the chicken or the egg, you know, yeah, we, we don't know, but that is a little bit of a positive predictor, whether people who are more active, they pick this up because they want to like monitor their physical activity or is it like a motivator to help meet the guidelines? Who knows? But there is, you know, there was some positive uh, news from the paper. Oh, that's good then. That's good. I'll keep an eye out for it. Um, yeah. The, I, yeah, because it seems like the, the nutrition tracking, the nutrition, at least the, the perception of controlling your nutritional intake and, and behaviors around it seems to be a lower barrier for most people. It seems to be almost like you, we feel morally obligated to do those things more than we do the physical activity. Um, so that, that's kind of just an interesting separation in my mind, in, anyways, because I just think about how many clients I sit down with in an initial assessment, having no background in physical activity, but a ton of background in diets and tracking and, and every bit of pro and products and supplements and around it. So kind of seems like that that's a little bit more of our cultural focus is that side of things. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I never thought of it that way. I always feel like uh, nutrition and physical activity go hand in hand, but I'm just so immersed in it <laughs> that like when I start talking about it, uh, you know, with my friends, they're just like, whoa, we're like back off. Like we don't even know the terms you're saying. And for me, it's just like my everyday banter. So mm. <laughs> it's hard to step away and kind of see that. Um, but yeah, tracking is a, I was at some point, you know, adamant about tracking, tracking is going to save the world. <laughs> and then I was like, I swung the other way and saying that was very, very controlling and it's leads to eating disorder. But now I'm, you know, my pendulum has kind of landed in the mm -hmm. middle where I, I strongly feel that 
um, your intention behind it matters. Like if you need to create awareness, if you don't know what a, a protein, carb and a fat source are, it can be very enlightening to see like peanut butter isn't a protein. Like, <laughs> wow, I really thought it was, you know, so that and, and, um, and if you have very specific goals, I can see why it would be really uh, interesting to track your, your food also. But then again, one of the reasons why we wanted to study the predictors of tracking was to see if like, if you have a vulnerable person, what happens to them when, it, when it starts, when they start to track, like if they get a lot of comments about their weight, if they get a lot of pressure to lose weight, if they're, they're high on compensatory behaviors, do you really need to intervene with a, um, a track, like a mm. food tracking, or do you need to intervene with something else first? And then perhaps like bring that in, uh, once some other things are dealt with, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, kind of coming full circle to just generally behavior change, it doesn't, it's not clear to me that though tracking is very low barrier to entry, it's pretty easy for people to figure out. It is a habit that needs to be introduced. Mm -hmm. So my mind, I think, what are some lower, uh, you know, eat more easily and replicatable um, barrier, or I'm sorry, behaviors that people can engage in, whether that's just adding in, you know, nutritious fruits and vegetables, maybe drinking more water, things like that, that are before tracking every single thing, not to mention, gosh, um, the, the accuracy of some of the, not only the, the weighing and the measuring itself, but also the databases and everything like that. But shout out to Macro Factor. From what I understand, Macro Factor has got a much more robust database than, than some of the others. But um, yeah. I would be kind of remiss if we didn't touch on a few of your practical tips. I mean, we've talked about a lot of it already, but just uh, what would, if someone was struggling with their own body image, um, right. you know, in, let's just say you're talking person to person with them, what are some tips that you would give them? Yeah, so some very low, you know, entry tips to starting to um, work on body image would be perhaps starting to reduce like social comparisons can be really helpful. And by that, I just mean, you know, tweaking your Instagram feed. Um, I did it. I, I, I get my clients to do it. If, it. if it's brought up in the conversation, it's not something like right away when we work together, you have to like curate your feed. Mm -hmm. Not at all. But if, if I start hearing language, like, you know, this person that I'm following, like they were able to lose weight so quickly. And then like, oh, this one's my age and she has two babies. Why doesn't my stomach look like hers? If I hear a lot of that language, then I start bringing up like, you know, like you can curate your feed. Um, it, it, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you that you're comparing yourself to this person. But if the comparison leads to this internal dialogue, maybe you want to back away from it. Um, increase your diversity on your feed, look at other bodies and other people being happy in other bodies, because sometimes that can be opening to like this person looks this way. And they're so happy too. like, maybe I can also look that way and still be happy. Um, so that is kind of a really easy step to do. Um, another thing, um, again, in this, I'm very like, um, client led coach, right? So these things aren't mandatory. And they're not like, I don't force anything. They're suggested if it comes up more or less naturally, or maybe I guide them a little bit that way if I see it's pertinent. But there are a few kind of um, robust or uh, not robust, I shouldn't say robust, but evidence-based um, uh, interventions on body image. Uh, Allura et al. has one, uh, I think her name's Allura et al., Jessica, I believe. Um, I'd have to look it up again, <laughs> just in case I'm wrong, but it's a very simple intervention that you can do where you just answer three questions about, um, your body and more its functions. So it's senses rather than it's aesthetics. And it's, it's almost like a letter to yourself. And they've shown that just after these three or four questions and you do like one a week or one, uh, uh, separate time points, I would do one a week. because I see my clients weekly. Um, that um, all these body image measures that they use pre and post this little intervention, they all improved significantly, which is something very easily done. And a client could take 10 minutes to, to write themselves a letter. So, uh, but not, again, not all clients want to do that. They're busy or, or they don't see the value in it. But those that do, um, I've seen differences. Um, and the last thing that I could say um, that can be really helpful is to... Um, to do an exercise around um, your um, your over evaluation of your appearance. So meaning without your appearance, like how do you want to leave this world? I know it's a bit morbid, but <laughs> like how, how do you want to leave this world? How do you want people to feel around you? Uh, what contributions do you want to make? Like 
any, like, give me a list, brainstorm for 30 minutes of, of, of your positive qualities of why you are valuable that have nothing to do your, with your appearance. And, and I see my clients struggle with that sometimes, but after the struggle, then the floodgates open up and I, I, there's a lot of crying sometimes during our sessions, <laughs> um, but it's, it's can be a beautiful thing to observe. And um, just through div- it doesn't mean your appearance doesn't matter, but it, it matters a bit less mm-hmm. that help contribute to this positive body image. And sorry, I thought of one more is also creating what I call uh, a body image shield. So creating um, these ideas that these negative body image thoughts will happen, but that you don't necessarily have to react Mm. to them um, is what I call your shield. So someone says a a negative comment about your body or that you perceive to be negative or that uh, you step on the scale and, you know, it, it creates a spiral. Like how can you create a shield to not make you so reactive to these, uh, to these moments and to kind of understand that they don't always, they don't last mm-hmm. and um, how to work through them. I think that that could be an absolute superpower just in our modern world in general, but especially in this situation, because yeah, the, it's not to say that you're never going to look in a mirror and have the thought, oh, I wish I weighed a little bit less or I had a little less body fat here. It's not to say that's not going to happen, but that's also not to say that that's not exactly what's happening. If you were lighter, if you were skinny, whatever it is, had more muscle, yeah. you're probably going to be more just as prone to those ideas and ideologies than somebody in any other situation. Um, I wanted to ask about though, the, the curating your feet, um, yeah. because that made me think of something. And in fact, all of the negative side of social media that you'd mentioned this could be flip positive very easily sure. because you are yeah. comparing yourself to others. Are there any other t- uh, ways to help curate that feed more? Do you need to just like go down a hashtag route and make sure you get flooded with the good stuff? Or is it just unfollowing people a good enough step and, and typically accomplishes quite a bit? Yeah, that, that's a really good point. I think you're, you're right that it could be looked at as like a stepwise thing. So I guess my first suggestion um, and my first suggestion is usually is, is that when you do this comparison or when you have this negative internal dialogue after viewing a particular image, that's when you remove the person. So it's not that I, I guess you could add others at the same time, but as a natural first step, it's like, oh, wow, this person, quote unquote, like triggered this. Let's remove them. This person, mm. let's remove them. This person, uh, you know, is going through a bodybuilding show and it's making me want to diet where right now my values are not in line with that. So like, let's remove them. And you can snooze them too, right? Like you don't have to remove them. Oh, shoot. I forget what um, behavior, you know, tr- uh, methodology this was, but um, asking if a thought is productive or not. Is this your exposure to this yeah. social media account productive for you? Because if it's not, guess what? Like there's a whole world of other experiences, other, other um, uh, accounts for you to follow that you do not need that negative account. And of course, some people like the doom scrolling. They want, they, they want to get those negative feelings and we have a tendency towards that. But I think that um, it really can come down to just asking yourself, what are your values and what do you want? Um, You mentioned kind of having that, that morbid uh, uh, question to yourself, letter to yourself. Um, you know, what, what do you want to leave this world as? What do you want your impact to be? And I think that more fitness professionals should be asking themselves that question, because if you are burning clients, really, what are you accomplishing? If you're leaving people behind you, probably not even just no better off, but worse off because they've had this negative experience with the fitness pro, like, what are you really accomplishing there? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I've worked with like numerous, um, women who have told me that they've had these kind of experiences with certain trainers that got them off physical activity for a long time. And that's not, you know, in a way, it's kind of like not a, not a cop out to say like this one comment triggered you so you could never be active again, but it, it, it um, created another barrier to on top of already a bunch of barriers that they had towards physical activity mm-hmm. and not even wanting to go into like a gym setting anymore for fear of like being <laughs> totally destroyed mentally again. Yeah. So it, it's, I personally, so I had a trainer, I had, well, I had a trainer and um, I have put on a lot of muscle in the past couple of years, which was by definition, like this was my goal. And he had seen a picture of me on my wedding, like about 10 years earlier, where I was much, much leaner, much more petite. And he, he took the time to take, it was on my friend's account. And he took the time to take out this picture and show me, he's like, what happened to you? 
And I was like, what do you mean what happened to me? And I was like, there, my body image shield went up because mm-hmm. had the old me heard that I would have been like time to cut like holy moly but I was like no like he's just a comment you can like deflect it but it, it I, to say it didn't bother me would be a lie but uh m- you know we need trainers saying less of things like this <laughs> more of let's hit a PR this week I think you're gonna have a good week you know yeah. If you want to talk about being unproductive, like what, what would the, what would the best outcome of that, this, that statement could be? There's no, there's not a positive. So I just don't like, is it just kind of emotional immaturity or not enough self-reflection or what, but I could not imagine thinking, Oh, that's a good idea to say this. And I've seen this. I, I mean, we do follow social media accounts for the purpose of seeing what is some of the, excuse my language, dog shit that people are telling and saying to their clients, you know, like calling them out on an Instagram story without saying their name, but, you know, calling them out specifically. Or um, I just saw an advertisement for a local trainer here that they were saying, you know, stay home if you, if you don't want it bad enough, like literally in the advertisement. Um, if, you know, are you ashamed at looking yourself in the mirror every morning? Well, come in to here. I'm like, it's a, it's just a six week challenge. What are you saying is going to happen? They're going to change their entire life in six weeks and they're good. Like, so I think that this kind of all goes into this next question, which I did not send to you ahead of time, but it's, no I think problem. it's important to, to kind of catch it just off the cuff. How do you feel that the fitness industry can improve just overall? Uh, I mean, a lot of the things that we've already said 100%, and I think it's going in that direction. I think there's yeah. like bio lanes out there who are calling out the, the science BS. <laughs> there are the, the Gabby's and the Shannon's who are like, hmm, maybe we need to bring in a little more than macros and and fitness programs into our coaching. So I think those are all headed in the right direction. Um, I think the courses that are being offered around body image, like Shannon's, I guess, you know, we're testing it empirically now, but my trainer who said a comment like that, had they taken Shannon's course, I think maybe that comment might not have come out of their mouth. Maybe not, there's no guarantees, but, um, you know, just creating this awareness of how people's body image affects their health habits and how guilt and shame Mm. does not elicit the response that you might think. Whereas having like a supportive uh, collaborative environment with your client, not only being the expert um, can actually contribute to like all these positive changes that a client's expecting to have um, rather than, you know, (laughs) stopping training because you feel fat shamed. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think we should all take a step back as an industry and be like, okay, what are the actual net effects of what we are doing? And is it congruent with what we say we want to do or what we want to do? Because a lot of times I don't think that's the case. I think that like, you know, in instance with, with your trainer, you end up pushing people further away from their goals, which is the exact opposite of what we're here to do. But yeah. Um, yeah. But anyways, Aaron, this yeah. was a great conversation. I, really I'm glad uh, to talk with you today. Um, we'll let you know when everything's coming out. And um, is there anywhere that you wanted to send people? I know that you, it seems like you work um, in a little bit different than, than most fields or most people that I've talked with. So is there anywhere you wanted to point people or anything like that? Sure. I mean, they can follow me on uh, Instagram. So EKO, which is my initials dot coaching. Um, uh, just find me on Instagram. I wouldn't call myself a very large influencer, but I have, mm. uh, <laughs> you know, I post weekly there. Um, and shout out to uh, the what we call the SAB Lab at the University of Toronto. I think we're trying to get together like a better social media uh, profile there, but we, we are on Twitter. Uh, and Instagram. Um, it's the M Park Lab. So M P A R C, I believe, uh, U of T. So check them out because there's a bunch of awesome research coming out from that lab. Unfortunately, my, uh, my uh, University of Montreal um, uh, lab there, we don't have uh, social media yet. <laughs> Yeah, better things to do with your time, I imagine. But yeah, I'll, we'll link to all of that. And um, we'll be looking out for your um, research on the tracking coming out um, sometime yeah. soon. Yeah, it should be. Um, I'm just trying to think of where it is in the process. We've responded to the reviewers comments. So we're waiting to hear. And uh, we're hoping that we get good news. Awesome. Well, we're looking forward yeah. to it. And have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much. You too.